Today's episode of Morning Coffee with Cameron was made possible by Sound Gym. Sound Gym is an ear training application designed specifically for music producers to help you identify differences in things like EQ, stereo positioning, compression, and basically every other aspect of production. If you want to get started training your ears and improving your sound, you can use the link down in the description and help support the channel in the process. Howdy doody buckaroonies, and welcome back. So here's a question. Do these two songs sound the same to you? A couple months ago, I posted a video called Let's Talk About the Splice Problem, where I posed a hypothetical scenario. If an artist uses some loops from a sample pack and releases the track, is that still their song? Well, that actually just happened, and it's been turning into a bit of a train wreck. So in this video, I wanted to explore why this situation is particularly tricky and see if we can find out if the artist actually stole these songs or not. So buckle in, because this one's going to get a little bit messy, especially considering that this is possibly not the first time that this artist has done this. On August 31st, 2021, producer Not Low released a track called Hallucination Effect. Not Low is a bass music producer and touring DJ who started releasing music around 2018 and has gone on to release with Deadbeats, Deep Dark and Dangerous, Odyssey Music, and Cyclops Recordings, and is currently managed by Compass Music Group. Not Low has maintained a notable presence in the bass music scene in the last couple of years, performing across the country and featuring in some major music festivals. On March 13th, 2023, Twitter user Xander Black posted a video with the following caption. Step 1. Find a dope sample pack with a demo track. Step 2. Take the demo track and rename it and release it as your own song on a label. Step 3. Rinse and repeat steps 1 to 2 multiple times. Step 4. Profit. The video highlights the blatant similarities between Notlow's track Hallucination Effect and the product demo track for Ghost Syndicate Audio's Nocturna dubstep sample pack. The video then goes on to showcase the similarities to another Not Low track titled Grudge, and the demo track for Ghost Syndicate Audio's Grimoire dubstep sample pack. And boy, oh boy, did this blow up quick. The absolutely explosive response to this revelation was pretty immediate, but interestingly, it was actually somewhat divided. On the one hand, some people see Not Low as an outright musical thief who ripped off the demo tracks in their entirety and deserves no credit whatsoever. On the other hand, some people feel that Not Low simply used the loops and samples from these packs for their intended purpose, to make music with them however they see fit, modified or not. And some other people fall somewhere in the middle. Sure, the tracks sound pretty similar, but that's just the cost of using loops and samples in your music. On March 14th, Not Low responded by releasing a statement, and in part it reads, I am deeply sorry I used to use a lot of samples and loops. I'm really excited about my unique recent and future releases. The response to this statement was equally mixed and sparked even further debate about the ethics of loops and sample packs and construction kits within the music industry. Using loops or samples in music is not really anything new or unique, especially in the context of modern music production. But every once in a while, there does seem to be this collective uh-oh Pischettios moment when a producer gets caught using a loop from a commercially available sample pack. But before we all break out the pitchforks and jump on the bandwagon here, I want to take a deeper look in this video at the sort of underlying issue here. But before we do that, can we prove or disprove that Not Low stole these songs. In audio production, there's a factor we have to be careful about with sounds called phase. If things are out of phase, the audio can start to sound kinda wonky. However, if two pieces of audio are completely out of phase, they actually fully cancel each other out. Here, I've opened up one of my own songs. Now, if I create a copy of it, then invert the phase of that copy, we can hear that the track actually becomes totally silent. However, if I create even a slight difference on the inverted copy, we'll start to hear the differences in phase between those two tracks caused by making any kind of change. Here we have Not Low's track Hallucination Effect, and the demo track for Ghost Syndicate's Nocturna Pack. 
Right away, we can see the tracks are different lengths with different waveforms, but the overall structure seems quite similar. Now, I should mention here that most people who claim Not Low stole this demo track and used it as their own do show that they made some minor alterations to the track by adding in some vocal samples and some other very minor differences. So, let's put that to the test. With all that in mind, if I phase invert one of these tracks, we should get an output of only the difference. So, not a lot really actually changes there. In fact, it just sounds like two songs playing over the top of each other, which means that they cannot be one-to-one -one identical recreations. If we actually normalize the two tracks against each other, we can see that there's a pretty substantial difference in the mix of the two tracks. What this really seems to indicate is that Not Low didn't simply steal and upload the demo track, but instead used the loops and samples provided within the sample pack to more or less recreate the demo track, but it's different enough to where it is objectively not identical to the original. So that brings us maybe to the bigger problem here. There's a sort of funny phrase I've heard from my friends who live in Nashville and work as songwriters. Change a word, keep a third. And what this is really expressing is the idea of making something just different enough to where you can have some sort of reasonable claim to that idea being your own. This is really skirting around the idea of substantial similarity, which is what so many famous cases of music copyright lawsuits have all come down to. What the idea of substantial similarity tries to prove is that average people without any advanced musical knowledge or expertise could listen to two pieces of music and identify them as being more or less the same. Now, in the case of most of the famous copyright lawsuits, it's eh, kind of a balancing act and it's sort of there if you listen for it. But this is a little bit different, I think, where this is so undeniably similar that it does come across as sort of a blatant ripoff. But given that it was made with loops provided in a pack, is that really the case or is this just a case of getting caught sampling? Loops and samples are a fundamental part of modern music production. In 1971, music was changed forever by the John Congo's track, He's Gonna Step On You Again, which used a sample of a recorded African drumline. Stevie Wonder's 1979 classic, Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants, furthered the use of samples in music and is often noted as the first album to make use of extensive sampling as an integral part of the music. These days, sample labels and services like Splice, Loop Masters, Ghost Syndicate, Origin Sounds, Black Octopus, Cymatics, and about a billion others have turned the once arguably niche art of sampling into a fully fledged commercial industry in its own right. That means that these days, as a musician, instead of needing to perform and record record and write and edit all of your own things, for only a couple dollars a month, you could get instant access to a bajillion gazillion royalty-free loops and sounds. So what does that phrase actually mean? Royalty-free sounds and loops boil down to a pretty simple definition. If you purchased a sample pack, you then have a right to use the sounds and samples in your own music, but you can't redistribute them in any other form. So while you are free to use my sad boy piano loops in your own song, you can't sell those loops yourself. The situation here alleges that Not Low outright stole the demo tracks for these sample packs and released them as their own, and the evidence presented is actually pretty damning. The Grimoire, Nocturna, Shinigami, and Erebus sample packs, which have all been presented as having their demo tracks stolen by Not Low, include either construction kits or project template files for DAWs like Ableton and FL Studio, which are two of the most popular DAWs in music production. These files exist in a slightly different space than the rest of the samples. Oftentimes, and in the case of the products here from Ghost Syndicate Audio, the license for the pack will explicitly state that the project files and or construction kits cannot be used as is for commercial release, or in some cases, cannot be released commercially whatsoever even if they've been modified. Construction kits are often included in sample packs like this as a sort of way to demonstrate the pack in action or to demonstrate to the user how a track might be constructed using these elements. You could then modify the track to some extent, change some loops out, change the tempo or things like that, or you could use it as just sort of a blanket foundation and change everything to create your own unique track. But there is nothing stopping you 
from simply exporting that track as it is and putting it out on the internet. If I used a service like DistroKid, for example, I could take this example project, render it out without making any sort of changes, and get that song released and uploaded to Spotify and iTunes and Amazon Music and everywhere else and have that out for the world to hear in only a few days. These construction kits and demo projects and things like that are a lot more common than you might think. And in fact, this is how I actually make the majority of my own musical income. I work primarily doing sound design and commissioned music for things like videos or games or sample packs or product demo tracks or other things in that neighborhood. And over the years, I've made I don't even know how many samples and loops and demo tracks and construction kits and things like that. When I do these things, I'm essentially signing away my rights to those loops and whatnot, so long as you don't go out and sell them yourself or release the construction kit as your own piece of work in most cases. You're free to use those loops however you see fit. You could time stretch them, you could pitch shift them, you could totally transform them with any amount of processing, or you could do nothing at all. And that's exactly what the problem is here. Personally, I've seen my own sample pack demos and construction kits and stuff get stolen and uploaded by other people. I've even had my own original music stolen off of websites like SoundCloud, where people then go and re-upload it as themselves. I've even had people download my YouTube videos and upload them to their own channels. In fact, I actually had to take down another one of those just this morning while working on the script for this video. And among my sound design and musician friends and colleagues, this is actually an all-too-common experience. Ben Jordan, perhaps best known as The Flashbulb, is a musical artist who's been releasing music under many different names since the late 90s and has had quite a bit of experience in the world of stolen tracks. Okay, so Ben, <laughs> welcome to the video. Uh, how many of your tracks have you had stolen yourself? Four or five come to mind, but probably more over the years. Some people literally will just sing over them other people will call it a remix. Other ones will just completely put their own name on it. Cassette Cafe, I mean, that is an old song that I wrote for FL Studio, and it came with FL Studio. And so I think people just, I'm not sure why they have, why they would release it as their own. I, I've never really cared, you know, that I wrote it for FL Studio for people to play with and dissect. I can't imagine not knowing better but I suppose I could imagine being brand new to music and hearing about ghostwriters and producers behind artists that you actually recognize and then saying, well, maybe the flashbulb is my ghostwriter now. For lack of a better term, you do have to kind of be stupid to make that assumption. I didn't understand why musicians really sampled unless it was just for a novelty of some sort until I started listening to Jay Dilla. And I was like, wow, you're taking this and turning it into something that is incredibly creative. I think if you're sampling as a way to get a song done, as much as I want to say that's the right way to do it, how much do you enjoy it? Are you still getting that dopamine fix? One of the things that I said about Notlo when people were asking me for my take on it is she didn't get to experience the joy of writing those songs herself. She wondered probably, oh, I hope I don't get found out. And she dreaded this day happening. And so punishing her beyond that is just a little bit silly because she robbed herself of you know, the reason we're musicians, supposedly, is because we like making music, and she didn't make it. This end of sampling and music production has caused a whole list of problems that I'm sure way too many music producers are all too familiar with. Because if I use a loop in one of my songs, I'm not obligated to provide any sort of credit for it, nor am I obligated to make any changes to it whatsoever. And neither are you even if you use the exact same loop in your own track. There are a ton of examples of popular artists using loops from commercially available sample packs in their own tracks, and it's really not common for them to be thrown to the wolves for doing so. Young Thug's track, Kill Before, uses a guitar loop from Electric Soul by Treehouse, with a few slight modifications to the pitch. Marshmallow's mega viral track, Friends, uses a guitar loop from the Prime Loops pack, Melodic Guitar Hooks, with a little bit of EQ and additional compression. Skrillex's track, Roughneck, uses samples from the Prime Loops Urban and Dance Vocals pack, with a couple of small alterations. 
There are even entire websites dedicated to hunting down the samples that artists have used, and one website even has a section specifically dedicated to finding loops from sample packs used in popular songs. Now, this is all fine because this is the nature of using royalty-free loops in music production, but every once in a while, for whatever reason, some producers get thrown in producer jail for using a loop even if it is royalty-free. One of the most well-known examples of this was probably in 2010, when Steve Angelo released the track Nas, which used a sample from Vengeance's Future House Sample Pack series. The difference between the two is pretty minimal. The original loop is fairly clean, and in Steve Angelo's track, a couple of effects are added, and of course it's layered with drums and other elements to create the finished product. And this is strikingly similar to the current situation with Not Low. A producer downloaded some loops, put some stuff together, and turned it into a track, but because the loops are too instantly recognizable, the ideas of artistic integrity and the integrity of sampling are called into question. In the last decade or so, this has turned into a classic debate in the music industry of if sampling makes artists lazy. After all, with samples and construction kits, it's now easier than ever for anyone to create a song without needing any real technical knowledge. You could slap together some loops, do some rough balancing, and have that uploaded to all the major streaming services in a matter of a few days. The commonly expressed sentiment here is that the days of true artistry and real musicians are all over. Electronic music has ruined music forever, and those with real talent who play real instruments are left to languish in obscurity, doomed to forever be a tortured artist, while the kids with their laptops go on to rake in their millions. Between the sample pack industry, the undying plague of MIDI packs, and other purported auto-talent devices and programs out there, it brings up the question, what's left that really separates those with true musical talent from those who simply copy and paste? In an effort to set aside my own biases here, I wanted to put this theory to the test that samples make for lazy music. To do this, I created a simple loop and asked some members of my Discord to create a track using the loop. Now, of course, a sample size this small isn't really a complete study, but I do think this is very much indicative of my experience as a professional sound designer in that most people seem to not really do much of anything when it comes to samples. This tendency for musicians to not modify loops combined with the mass availability of the samples has also led most music production agencies to outright ban using loops from services like Splice or Loop Masters in production music libraries, which is something I've seen myself with almost every music licensing library I've worked with and composing gig I've worked on. John Meyer is a composer and producer who makes his living as a media composer and sound designer, as well as managing the label Merge Production Music, where he oversees a team of composers creating music for media. Okay, so John, thank you for joining me. You are my resident expert here. So as a composer, generally speaking, you're just not allowed to use loops? I don't, I wouldn't go that far. I could talk about this for hours, but specifically, no, but yes, but no, but yes. I absolutely stay away from melodic loop. When I speak of this, like in my videos, it's more about fingerprint services, rep recognizing this and making it difficult for people to get paid on the back end. It gets tied up in the system. And if a thousand people have the same melodic loop, that means it's going to go into some folder and it may be difficult to ever get paid for it on the production music side of things. That's a difficult thing as someone who creates loops. I'm like, hey, here are these awesome loops that I want you to buy, but don't use them, you know, which is a which is a big ask for somebody to do because it, you get stuck on something and it becomes part of what you do. If I'm trying to create something that's a style that I'm not all that interested in, I love arcade and all those things because these are quality people like yourself making these sample packs that I can learn from and deconstruct. So I absolutely use them as research, but yeah, when it comes to finally getting down to putting it in the DAW, you got to be careful with stealing anything melodic. You start trying to go back and who the originator is, and yeah, that's a mess. We are just so, especially when it comes to hip hop music and electronic music, we're always so on edge when we hear stuff because it is so easy to make amazing sounding music with very little effort but at the same time it's 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 requested it's needed like this kind of stuff gets used you almost have to have conversations with people to try your best to discern is this a legitimate person that's not trying to screw me over right it's a quick solution it's a quick fix but it's not it's not a long-term business plan for a composer as an artist i think it's a cheap way out 
And I think that it doesn't help develop your skills as a composer. And you're just asking to get other people in trouble or you're asking to get yourself in trouble. And I think it's best to avoid it as much as possible and probably avoid it completely. Sampling has become a time-honored tradition in music. Whether you're using a one-shot or chopping up a drum loop to make a D&B banger or whatever, it is just something that is so tightly weaved into the fabric of modern music production. But many producers feel that there's a deeper art to sampling in the art of flipping. Flipping a sample can mean any number of things. It could be chopping up and rearranging a loop. It could be time-stretching the sample to create a different tempo. It could be pitching the sample up or down to a different musical key, or it could be entirely transforming it with any degree of processing from the endless tools that producers have at their disposal. But does not modifying a sample really make you a lazy producer? I've had, I don't even know how many artists reach out to me over the years letting me know that they used my sounds or loops or instruments or whatever in their songs, and every time my reaction is pretty much the same. That's really cool. I'm happy that it inspired them to make something. Whether they modified it or not, I really don't care. I'm just happy they enjoyed using it. However, in the cases where artists claim to be making original music when it's really just sampled or outright stolen, or in the case of sound design when people make loops that are stolen or heavily inspired by other artists like the infamous case between Kashmir and Mick Gordon, I think that's where the line starts to become a bit more clear. In the case of sample packs with construction kits or project files, if someone releases those tracks as is and it's a violation of the sample pack license, then of course that's definitely a problem. But if someone just happens to use some loops that are recognizable from a pack to create something maybe marginally different, are they really truly in the wrong? So what do you make of all of this? Is Notlow guilty of plagiarism? Is Notlow just another victim of getting caught sampling? Or is there maybe another angle to all this that hasn't really been considered yet? Given how sort of weird the situation is, I'd be very curious to get your thoughts on all of this. In the meantime, though, don't forget to get off the internet and maybe go make some music this week. And I guess the homework assignment for this one might be to transform a sound or a sample as much as you possibly can so that you don't have to go to producer jail, too. Well, hey there. That's the end. A very big thank you to my Discord community members who participated in my little experiment. You can find their links down in the description below. Be sure to go support them and show them a little bit of extra love for me. And of course, a huge thank you to my patrons as well for making videos like this possible. If you enjoyed this video and you want more ones like it, then hey, I know a guy, and I am that guy. And you can subscribe. It's free, and I put videos out on the internet when I'm done with them. And you can watch them again. And we can do this again sometime. Until then, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And of course, as always, I hope this inspires you to get out there and make something awesome.